Welcome to HashiConf Global and to our attendees joining us from all over the world. I'm here to give a quick company update and then I'm going to hand things over to Armand and then Mitchell. A warm, warm welcome from both myself, but also from more than 1,500 employees from HashiCorp, most of whom work from home across more than 790 cities in 20 different countries. Over the next couple of days, we're going to have well over 12,000 attendees join us, and they are coming from an amazing 100 plus countries around the globe. You'll see that we've redesigned a few elements of this event to best allow our practitioners to engage with us and engage with our products, but also with each other. You'll see that we've added hands-on labs in the HashiCorp zone to give practitioners hands-on experience and be able to interact with our products and employees on a much more one-to-one -one basis. And as always, the sessions from this event will be available on demand if you want to come back and watch something that you missed. And they will be moved to our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. As you've seen from us before, HashiCorp is really built around working closely with three critical sets of constituents. And we couldn't do what we do without all of you practitioners, our ecosystem of customers and our ecosystem of partners, and then our customers that ultimately serve to enable them to adopt this cloud model for infrastructure. But the practitioners, you here in the audience, are the heart of what we do. You're the ones who download our products, you use them every day, and you give us the feedback that allows us to make those products better. In fact, in many instances, you contribute to the products yourselves. This event and the participation around the globe is actually a testament to the power of that singular community that's aligned us around this really consistent idea of enabling this common operating model for infrastructure. We saw over 100 million open source downloads in the last year alone, which is a staggering, staggering number to consider. We know that works out to well over 10,000 different organizations around the globe. And actually more interestingly to me, it's more than 75% of the Fortune 500. That means our products are underpinning a huge percentage of the applications that we all use every day already. And the community that makes this happen uh, really manifested in well over 12,000 individuals who contributed code to us over the last 12 months in the form of 280,000 code commits, which ultimately, in many instances, got incorporated into our products. That's the power of a common community. And whether they're meeting virtually or in a select few cases in person, we now have over 36,000 HashiCorp user group members across more than 140 chapters in 50 plus countries around the globe. A thank you to each of you who make our community the vibrant and supportive place that it is. Our ecosystem of partners also plays an incredibly critical role. Ultimately, we're working most closely with the public cloud providers for whom our products enable a consistent on-wrap to the use of their myriad of technologies that they introduce each and every year. Our technology partners contribute and enable integrations to our products to allow our products to connect their products to the cloud providers and beyond. And then we partner with the global and regional system integrators and resellers who do the hard, hard work of ensuring our customers are successful as they adopt this tech, which is relatively new to many of them. All told, we have well over 1,400 Terraform providers in our, in our Terraform registry alone, which speaks to the breadth of integrations that have been provided by all of you to enable this common approach to infrastructure. We have well over 700 unique partners, including 170 ISVs. And these numbers continue to grow as we become mission critical to our customers, but also increasingly integral to the entire software ecosystem. Thank you to each and every one of you for your collaboration and your partnership. And last but not least, thanks to our more than 2,100 commercial customers for the faith that they place in us every day. We're proud to serve a hugely diverse set of organizations, including companies like the ones you see on the slide, General Motors, Anaplan, Pandora, Ubisoft, Comcast, Roblox, Wayfair, Petco, Barclays, and many, many more. We serve small cloud native organizations at the very, very leading in edge of infrastructure, all the way up to the more traditional enterprises. In fact, today, over 315 of the Fortune 2000 are HashiCorp commercial customers. What's most interesting to me, actually, is that we're seeing the blueprints for how to run infrastructure that was pioneered by and large by the cloud native environments using the HashiCorp products to underpin their infrastructure automation, security automation, networking automation, and enabling that application delivery process 
that underpins the cloud operating model, that blueprint is actually making its way almost intact to the global 2000. And that's what we see each and every day. A huge focus for, for us over the past several years has been to make it easier and easier for you all to use our products in that provision, secure, connect and run uh, role that we play for everybody, ultimately to run that cloud operating model. And one way we're doing this is through the delivery of the HashiCorp cloud platform, which you'll see us refer to as HCP. The HCP is our fully managed cloud platform for running any of our products. It helps organizations with resource and skills gaps, improving operations and, sp and speeding up deployment time for our customers so they can spend more time focused on in their, their applications than on their cloud native infrastructure. So far, we've delivered HCP Console, Vault, and Packer. Terraform Cloud was introduced late last year, and there's more to come, as you'll hear from Armand and Mitchell. We've already seen thousands and thousands of users get started with our cloud offerings in the very short time since we've launched them. Several of the products, most notably HTTP Console and Vault, went GA this year, so it's still relatively recent. I'd encourage everybody to seek out the HCP-related content at HatchConf this week. Thank you for joining us on this journey, which many of you have been on with us for quite some time. And thank you for joining us at this digital event. I'm going to hand things over to Armand now, who has a number of updates to announce related to HashiCorp's newest products and technologies. Armand, over to you. Thank you so much, Dave. And welcome to HashiConf day one. I'm super excited for today. We're going to focus today on giving updates on our new emerging products, two of which we released this time last year at HashiConf, Boundary and Waypoint, and HCP Packer, which we announced over the summer. So as we dive in and talk about Boundary, just to set the stage, I think one of the things we spend a lot of time as an industry now talking about is this transition to zero trust security. It's clear there's been a shift in the modern threat landscape. We need to spend more time hardening the inside of our networks. And we're seeing over and over again these massive cybersecurity attacks. This is starting to spill over into the news coverage. We're seeing more of these breaches, and we're seeing things like the Biden executive order mandating a shift over to zero trust. So clearly, there's a lot happening right now, uh, and we're excited to think about the future of security. I think one of the challenges when we talk about the traditional approach to security, which we refer to as sort of castle and moat, is what we really focused on was securing the four walls of the data center and bring all of our traffic over a well-defined drawbridge. And it was over that point that we brought our firewalls, our web application filters, our various security approaches to basically secure it and say the outside is bad and untrusted, the inside is good and high trust. And I think the challenge we've seen with that model is that it doesn't quite work, right? Our workloads are too dynamic. As we have cloud infrastructure and on-prem infrastructure and people working from home, the network just isn't clean and well-defined. There isn't a single point of traffic coming in and out. So it's too hard to secure that perimeter. We need to move beyond that and think about hardening and securing the inside of our networks as well. So that's really the heart of this transition to zero trust, is moving away from trusting our network to instead explicitly authenticating and authorizing all of our applications, our users, our systems, and the access between them. So how do we really make that happen? For us, there's four key pillars of enabling it. The first pillar of zero trust is establishing human identity. At the heart of that is really a single sign-on for our users, as well as a common user directory. There's many ways we can solve this. It might have been done with things like LDAP and Active Directory on-premise. Now it might be done with a cloud-based IDP like Okta, Ping, or Microsoft's Azure AD. Right? So many different solutions there, but it's about this common user identity. On the other side of that is how do we think about machine identity? This is a relatively new problem, not one that we traditionally solved. And this is really where Vault sits. At the heart, what we're trying to do is enable Vault to bring in application identity, whether it's a traditional app running on-premise and it's being brokered through Active Directory, whether it's a cloud-native app and it's using AWS or GCP or Azure's IAM model, or whether it's running on an application platform like Kubernetes. Regardless of where the app is, Vault's there to enable a consistent approach to identity. And once we have that, we can extend that to apply to things like secret management or data protection. Join us later today. We're going to have a deep dive in on Vault and the roadmap there uh, if you want to learn more. Once we have the first two, human identity and application identity, then the middle two pillars are about governing the access between systems. 
So the first challenge is a machine-to-machine -machine access problem, right? Our web server that connects to the database. How does it discover it? How do we secure that connection? And so that's where console sits, is really allowing us to bring an identity-based approach to securing those machine-to-machine -machine interactions. We have a lot more updates about console tomorrow, and I'll be excited to talk about them then. The last pillar is really about then human-to-machine access, right? How does a developer access a database system? How do we secure that? How do we make sure that it's done based on identity, even as our infrastructure is highly dynamic? That's the problem we set out to solve with Boundary, which we introduced last year. And so if we talk about the traditional approach to having privileged access, it starts with a user. That user is then first connecting to, let's say, a VPN system or an SSH bastion. And to do that, they need to have username and password or a certificate or an SSH key, et cetera, that they need to manage. Then once you're on our, the network, you don't want the user to have access to everything. So traditionally, you're going to apply a firewall or an IP-based set of controls to restrict what they have access to on the inside of the private network. Then you might use a privileged access management system so the user can get a credential, let's say a database password, or to session record and have visibility on what they did to make sure no one's you know, exfiltrating data or running commands they shouldn't. And then ultimately, the user gets access to the endpoint system. right? So the challenge with this is there's many different systems a user has to interact with that's kind of kludgy. There's many different controls that an administrator has to deal with to ensure that the system is secure. And particularly as our infrastructure becomes more dynamic, this setup becomes brittle. And so this was the challenge we looked to solve with Boundary. So the idea is to simplify and collapse all three of those layers into one. So a user doesn't have a separate set of credentials or username and password. They do a single sign-on with their existing identity provider. right? That identity provider then enables a logical rule where we can say, great, our developers have access to our web services, for example. Right? Boundary doesn't give the user direct access to the network. Instead, it will directly proxy back to whatever the host is. So we don't need another layer of firewall. We also don't need another layer of privilege access management. Vault is or Boundary is establishing that session, managing it, and providing the credentials that the user needs. So collapsing those three different systems really into one. And so over the last year, we invested heavily in Boundary uh, and really maturing the tool since we first launched it. So I wanted to just give a preview and a review in some sense of what we've done in that last year. The first that I'm really excited about is making the desktop UI much richer for end users. Right Now we have a desktop client for Mac, Windows, and Linux. It provides an intuitive and easy way for developers to log in, see what they have access to, double click, and initiate a connection into whatever system or target they need to access. At the same time, we've introduced OIDC integration. This makes it easier to integrate Vault and Boundary with any of your existing identity providers, such as Okta, Ping, Microsoft Azure AD. And so now you can have that seamless single sign-on experience for the end user. We've also integrated Boundary and Vault. So one of the challenges we often see is credentials living in multiple places, once for human users in a different place for a machine-to-machine -machine interaction. And so what this enables is all the credentials can live centrally within Vault, and Boundary can broker access to it as needed within the context of a session. So as you initiate a connection, Boundary can fetch the credential and provide it to the user. It might be a static credential that we're just brokering access to, but it might be a dynamic credential that Boundary is creating just in time for that individual session. So this allows Boundary to use Vault to create that short-lived credential, just use it for the one session, and when the user disconnects, talk to Vault and revoke it. So this really starts to move us to very ephemeral, short-lived credentials that minimizes the risk of any sort of an exposure. We're super excited about the traction the Boundary project is seeing. It's already been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. It's being used by some of the world's largest organizations. And it's only been a year since we introduced it. So super excited about the traction. We also love hearing from our community, whether that's on our Discuss forum, whether that's through GitHub, or whether we're seeing some of the social engagement. It's fun to see all the excitement around the project. And so if you're excited about Boundary and you want to help us evolve the, uh, the project over the next few years, we've created a program we call the Boundary Insiders Program. So for folks who are on the bleeding edge of security and pushing the zero trust transformation, we want to hear from you. We want your feedback to continue to evolve the program. So please join that. So as we talk about Boundary, it sits in this context of this larger effort from HashiCorp to think about zero trust security. 
as we do so, it's clear to us we sit in an ecosystem of partners and we work closely with our technology and cloud partners in really making Zero Trust easy and more accessible. One of the most steadfast partners for us on this has been Microsoft. When we talk about the Microsoft partnership with HashiCorp, it spans a whole range of products. Right? With Terraform, we have deep support with Azure as well as Active Directory through their MS Graph API. So there's rich integrations around enabling an infrastructure as code way of interacting with different Microsoft products. With Vault, we've integrated it tightly with Azure and the identity model there, allowing applications to authenticate with Vault, allowing Vault to broker dynamic access to Azure systems. We have a native HashiCorp console service on Azure, so you can get a managed version of console and natively provided within the Azure platform. And we've enabled deep single sign-on integration across all the products. So it's only logical that with Boundary, we also look to Microsoft to drive a deeper integration and partnership for our joint users and customers. So I'm super excited today to announce the expansion of our partnership with Microsoft. Microsoft is a leading vendor in the enterprise identity space with their Azure AD product. And so it was natural that we'd want Boundary to work very closely with that to enable seamless human to machine interaction. So to talk more about this, I'm excited to introduce Sue Bone from Microsoft to share a little bit more about what we're doing together. Over to you, Sue. Thank you, Arman. We're thrilled to be collaborating with HashiCorp on providing secure remote access to hosts and critical systems across platforms and across clouds. Hybrid and multi-cloud infrastructure are now the norm. In fact, in a recent survey we commissioned, 97% of IT decision makers describe their environment as hybrid, and 91% use at least two public clouds. With hybrid and multi-cloud environments as your foundation, any disruption can have devastating effects. Here at Microsoft, we're committed to help protect any customer environment, regardless of the apps, clouds, or platforms they use. To protect these varied environments, it's imperative to have a strong identity foundation. As the world's largest cloud identity service, Azure Active Directory has grown to process over 100 billion authentication requests per day and protects over 425 million monthly active users across many different environments. Thousands of organizations trust Azure AD as their first line of defense against cyber attacks, and it has been essential to many organizations' zero trust strategy. Let's talk a little bit more about zero trust. Microsoft shares the same philosophy as HashiCorp, that the old security paradigm that relies on firewalls and VPNs no longer applies. Today, there's no single network perimeter, no boundaries across collaboration, plus there's been an explosion of devices and applications. We think of zero trust as a worldview and a security strategy, which has been put to good use with the increase of secure remote work during the pandemic. Zero trust replaces the assumption that everything behind the corporate firewall is safe with three simple principles, verify explicitly, use least privileged access, and assume breach. It requires validation at every step of the process. It means that all touch points in a system, identities, devices, and services are verified before they're considered trustworthy. And it means that user access is limited only to the data, systems, and applications required for that role. By moving from a model that assumes trust to one that requires verification, we can reduce the number and severity of security breaches. Our partnership began with Terraform, leveraging the Microsoft Graph to make it easier to manage Azure Active Directory resources with infrastructure as code. We're continuing our strategic partnership with Boundary, and we're excited to provide organizations streamlined zero trust access management to infrastructure resources while having improved visibility into session activity across platforms and data centers. With Boundary and Azure Active Directory, customers can access any system from anywhere based on their Azure Active Directory user identity. Boundary will be accessible within the Azure AD App Gallery, enabling developers to securely access hosts and services in hybrid and multi-cloud environments. Our two teams are currently working on deeper integration between Boundary and Azure Active Directory to offer a seamless automated onboarding 
of an Azure tenant's identities, targets, roles, and permissions to a boundary environment. In the future, we'll be working together to enable Vault to access, to access Vault using Azure Active Directory. Together, we're offering solutions and frameworks for zero trust without adversely impacting productivity in today's hybrid and multi-cloud world. Back to you, Armin. Thank you so much, Sue. I'm so excited for this partnership. I know it's early days, but I'm very, very excited for what we can do by bringing these products closer together and making Zero Trust more accessible for our joint users. For people that are interested in checking this out, we're going to have a breakout session about this tomorrow, and you can learn more about how you can be using Boundary with Azure AD right away. And now I'm super excited to welcome to the stage Mitchell Hashimoto, co-founder of HashiCorp, to give us the rest of today's product update sessions. Welcome, Mitchell. Thanks. Thanks so much, Armand. Next up, I want to talk about Waypoint. A year ago, we announced HashiCorp Waypoint, an open source project that simplifies how developers build, deploy, and release applications across any platform. When we announced Waypoint, we shared this core thesis for the project, which is that developers just want to deploy. We still have that thesis today driving the project. Developers today have a vast variety of tools at their fingertips, but the deployment workflow is still complex. Let's start with just the release platform itself and take a look at Kubernetes as an example. The main challenge facing developers with Kubernetes is how much they need to interact with Kubernetes in order to deploy an application. For example, just to deploy a simple two-tier web application, a developer needs to interact with almost a dozen Kubernetes core objects, such as pods, services, or higher level components, such as deployments, stateful sets, et cetera. A developer needs to be aware of what they are, how to configure them, and set them all up in order to make everything work. And the platform is just one part of the end-to-end -end workflow in order to get an application from source code into production. The other part is sort of the workflows around all the other stages, such as build, deploy, release management, et cetera. Operators generally build these automated workflows with many tools in order to bring some sort of consistency and velocity to the process. However, due to the heterogeneity of the workloads, the applications and their platforms, all of these end up really tightly coupled to the environment or a particular ecosystem. This tends to lead to inflexible workflows, limited shared knowledge, or just an inconsistent developer experience, especially if new technologies are introduced into the stack. And this is exactly why we created Waypoint, to solve these two challenges, which are really two sides of the same coin. Waypoint aims to solve the deployment challenge by enabling developers to get their applications from development to production in a single configuration file with a unified workflow. It's been a year since we announced Waypoint, and the project has evolved in many ways. I want to start by sharing a few highlights over the past year and the past few releases, and, and then offer some insight into where the project has, is headed from there. First, we introduced variables, templating, and other key features really aimed at improving the Waypoint configuration file to enable developers and operators to create more reusable, dynamic Waypoint configurations. For example, we can now dynamically template Docker files and bring in elements that are dependent on the environment staging, production, et cetera. We can also define input variables in the Waypoint configuration files that could be used to parameterize the configuration file for reuse. In addition to the configuration file, we built a lot of new features directly into the server and core workflow itself. One of the biggest ones is native GitOps workflow support. This is also the recommended way to use Waypoint today. Waypoint can be configured to automatically update applications as changes are pushed to a Git repository. And finally, we also made some big changes into the post-deploy world of Waypoint. We built a feature to enable near real-time visibility into deployments and their health status. This allows developers and operators to easily monitor the applications and resources through staging and production environments. And over the past year, we observed that many of our users are primarily looking for ways to simplify the complexity of Kubernetes in their deployment environments. This is one of the most popular deployment platforms, and we see this as the most popular place to simplify. Therefore, in this release and over the next few releases, we're really doubling down on Waypoint's focus on Kubernetes, and we have a lot of improvements there. Our goal with Waypoint is to empower operators to deliver a pass-like experience for Kubernetes 
and to be able to scale that experience consistently across other platforms such as ECS, Nomad, Serverless, and more. And towards these new goals, we're pleased to unveil Waypoint 0.6. This release ships many features that fundamentally improve Kubernetes workflows, and I want to share some of them with you now. The first starts at the installation of Waypoint. We now support a Helm-based Helm install for Waypoint. And this is the recommended way to install Waypoint if you're a Kubernetes user. So now, if you use Kubernetes, you could use Helm and get a fully production-ready Waypoint server on your cluster. Continuing the theme of Helm, but on a separate end, we now support Helm as a way to deploy your applications. So if your organization already writes Helm charts or already has applications with a number of Helm charts, you could bring them right into Waypoint and begin deploying right away without rewriting any of that. We also switched with Waypoint 0.6 into utilizing a runner-based architecture where all operations like builds, deploys, et cetera, happen on on-demand pods that are launched in your Kubernetes cluster. So these are fully isolated per operation, and you could customize the image that runs, the, that runs these operations. With that, you could have much better security and much better customizability over all your operations. And whether it's Kubernetes, ECS, or any other platform, Waypoint provides a workflow that allows users to better describe the necessary changes for each environment. For example, here, we're setting a different configuration variable for the dat database URL, whether it's staging or production. And you could do this across any sort of application configuration. And in future, ver future versions, we'll continue to introduce environment-specific features into Waypoint. Now, let's take a look at a few examples of how the changes we made in 0.6 improve the Kubernetes workflow. Kubernetes users today need to adopt multiple tools to define and update resources, or at least be aware that they exist. For example, you have to know Docker exists, how to write a Docker file. You have to know about kubectl, how to execute that to look at resource health. If you, if you write Helm charts or use something like Customize to deploy your applications, you need to be able to know how to write and use both those tools. But with Waypoint, we can still leverage many of these tools, but represent them within a single configuration file and invoke them within a single workflow. Put another way, many users today need to manage multiple sets of configuration files for different environments and invoke different tools. This becomes increasingly difficult over time, especially as new tools are introduced. But with Waypoint, they can manage and promote resources across environments more efficiently and consistently with a single configuration file and a single workflow. And to restate the, restate the goals of Waypoint and what's important to us with this project, first, we want to enable a consistent pass experience for Kubernetes, ECS, and other platforms. Next, we want to build a tool that really solves the end-to-end -end workflow from development into production to simplify the whole process. We're not just focused on the one step of deploying to a platform. We want to keep the configuration application-centric in order to hide some of the infrastructure complexity from developers and to give platform builders and operators more flexibility to introduce new tools into the stack. And last, we want all of this to be highly extensible. So whether you're doing a build, deploy, or release, all of that tooling, what you use, what platform you're going to, all of that are plugin-oriented, uh, plugin and you could write custom plugins yourself. So this was just a brief overview of Waypoint 0.6. If you want to watch a full product demo showcasing a real product being adopted into Waypoint on Kubernetes, then please see the breakout session later today. Or if you just want to get started, go to the Waypoint website, download it, and get started. Next, I want to talk about the HashiCorp Cloud Platform, or HCP. HCP is a really big deal for us. We're investing in it constantly, and you'll, con you'll continuously see a lot of exciting new services from us. One service we announced in June is HCP Packer. For HCP Packer, we designed it to solve a specific problem in image management. We noticed that in Packer, it's easy to build images, and it's easy to consume images, but there's a gap in the middle where it's difficult to know what images exist, how they're versioned, what changes exist, whether it's safe to use one or not, et cetera. And this is the problem that we're really addressing with HCP Packer. The first thing that this service aims to offer is an artifact registry hosted on HCP that addresses this gap. 
Now, the Packer builds still happen wherever they're happening today, on your local machine, within a CI environment, et cetera. HCP Packer, it doesn't aim to be Packer in the cloud. Instead, after the Packer build succeeds, metadata about that artifact is sent to HCP Packer and stored in the artifact registry. This registry can then be used with any modern tool chain, but it's especially useful if you use, use it with Terraform Cloud. In recent months, since we initially announced this project, we launched the private beta, and we've received a lot of great feedback from those private beta users. On top of that, we're excited now to move that service to the next phase of availability, which is the public beta. So what you should do now is log into your HTTP portal, and you'll immediately see the new Packer service in your account. The beta is free to use. To try out our other services, or if you don't have an HTTP account already, please sign up for one at cloud.hashicorp.com. For HTTP Packer, the hosting of image metadata for your workflows is just the first step in addressing a larger set of challenges that we see. The cloud-enabled registry could also simplify tasks like remediation, enforce security checks, and image deployment. So for example, with remedi remediation, we could keep images up to date with remediation workflows, revoke images, ranges of images, et cetera. With enforced security checks, we could ensure that your images are scanned for certain security properties and so on. And all of these are things that we're looking into in future iterations of HTTP Packer. To learn more about HTTP Packer, make sure to watch Megan, Megan's Packer breakout tomorrow, or log in to cloud.hashicorp.com and play around with the service right now. So today, we covered our emerging products, but we're of course going to provide updates on our core products as well. Check out the roadmap sessions for Terraform, Vault, and Nomad today, and console tomorrow. And also, come back for the day two keynote for some more exciting announcements and updates. Later today, Armand is also going to do a fireside chat with Wayfair, so catch that as well. Thank you very much.